Uh, so this work is a um, continuation of what we started last year at uh, NetDev in Seoul. Um, just wanted to give some credit here to uh, one of my coworkers at Intel, Nirav Parikh, who couldn't make the trip. Uh, he was involved in this um, on the architecture side, and then we had the opportunity to uh, collaborate with Saeed uh, from Mellanox, uh, who will be joining me here in a few minutes to share some of the data uh, that he's also been working on. So hopefully we'll find this useful. Um, <clears throat> so just to level set everyone in case people didn't get to see the presentation last year or see the, uh, the recordings, we'll do a quick recap of what we started last year. What, what was the idea, what was the goal um, on looking at accelerating XDP using hardware offloads? Um, we'll look at some of those performance results that kind of encouraged us to continue working on this because it seemed very, very promising. Um, and then we decided that for this year we should probably look at some real world uh, benchmarks and applications. Um, and not to steal too much thunder of the load balancer that'll be described tomorrow, uh, we did look at um, a layer four load balancer and how it would react to manipulation using hardware offloads. Um, and we found some very interesting data, uh, interesting in a good way and a bad way. Uh, and then Saeed will come up and talk about some similar real world um, tests that he was using on uh, NCAP DCAP with tunneling. And then we'll get into what Dave um, kind of alluded to. We started the description of how do we actually program from an eBPF program or an XDP program down to the NIC to say, I want these hardware offloads. Please express them for me in some format. And that has been kind of a, an area of discussion on the mailing lists, uh, especially in the IOVisor community. Uh, we haven't really ground out on a resolution as to what it looks like, but I think we have an idea of where we want to take it. Um, and then where do we go from there? <clears throat> so I'm not going to read through the big eye chart, but um, this was about four different slides from last year crammed into one, so excuse the, uh, the, the tiny font. But basically what we were looking at is every XDP program at some point has to parse the header, right? Has to know what kind of packet it's dealing with. And we, we kind of looked at this problem from a different perspective that the NIC, the hardware, already did the parsing already had to identify what that thing was, where the headers are, um, is there any relevant data that it needs to pull out to compute things like um, the RSS checks or the RSS hash, um, validate checksums, et cetera. So can we leverage that metadata coming out of the hardware to hand that off to XTP so that XTP just didn't have to do that, right? So we can just save CPU cycles. That was the, that was the premise. Um, some of the other things that we, we approached this with were um, keeping this as hardware agnostic as possible, right? We have a variety of vendors with a variety of features that kind of do the same thing, but in various different ways. Um, and we wouldn't want to impose any specific vendor secret sauce into the XDP framework that would kind of pollute it uh, for others to be able to utilize it. Um, bless you. And uh, this was on, on also two sides. How could we take existing NICs that are out there that are kind of dumb? Uh, maybe they can do a couple different types of offloads. Could we squeeze a little bit of blood out of the turnip from that? And looking forward to more intelligent, more flexible NICs that are showing up in the market now and things planned in the future, how can we either take what they're providing already uh, into the XDP framework, or how could we influence the design of that hardware to better benefit XDP? Um, and one of the last things that we closed with last year that we kind of threw it out there and we punted, um, and we, we might be punting again, is the, not just the metadata itself, but how can we take advantage of some of the hardware's capabilities of matching an action, like TCAMs, um, to be able to take some kind of a, an identification thing and then take an action and actually drop the packet in the hardware instead of having to refer it back to the driver. You know, can, can we offload some of these eBPF XDP semantics to the hardware? So not getting, this is a graph that we showed last year, just to, again, level set everyone. Um, the very, very important thing to focus on here is the bottom three XDP1, XDP3, XDP hints um, with JIT because, you know, we just don't do no, we, we, no JIT JIT. Um, and the three programs that we have here are the, the sample kernel code for XDP1 and XDP3, 
XTP1 is we parse the packet, identify the protocol, count it in a map, and then drop it. Right? There's no other parsing. Um, XTP3 was to show how fast can we just drop packets. We don't parse anything, we don't take any cache misses, we don't have to prefetch, and we don't um, do any type of counting or accounting in the maps. So that's kind of like the raw theoretical performance. And then the third one was we would take the packet type identified by the, by the driver, by the, the actual hardware, and this goes into the whole discussion of how do we commonize packet types identified by hardware. That, that's a can of worms that we may not want to get into right now. Um, but we go ahead and take that that's passed from the driver into uh, the XTP program, see which uh, packet type it is, count it, and then drop it. So we never parse the actual uh, packet in the XTP program. We just get the data that's referred to it. And so the rightmost bar, um, we hit a hardware limitation um, of that, that version of the NIC with that firmware, um, but it had very low CPU utilization. So we saw that this had really, really big potential um, that if the hardware was giving you the data, uh, that we can get some really, really good performance. So that spawned uh, the rest of this work. So there's some new stuff. Um, so this next slide and the slide after this deal with the uh, layer four load balancer. This is loosely based on the CATRAN load balancer that was mentioned many times today uh, from Facebook. Um, we took um, kind of a version of that and made some modifications. Um, so what we did was we had two types of uh, hints, uh, changes that we made. So the first one was just p-type, packet type. Uh, and the second one, hints type two, was everything from hints type one, so packet type, plus your four tuple, source destination IP, source destination port, uh, and then your RSS hash. Um, so in this case, uh, and we have various things here, and I know it's a bit of an eye chart, but the important ones here are the bottom three, the XDP load balancer, no hints with four queues. That's that um, bluish bar here, right there. And then hints type one, we took a little bit of a hit in performance. Uh, we didn't dig terribly deeply into this, but we looked at a couple things and it looked more of a, we were actually taking a cache hit um, or a cache miss uh, hit because we weren't parsing the rest of the header. We were getting the packet type and that's one of the first things the XDP program does and that does effectively a prefetch to get the rest of the deeper part of the header. And in this case, we were already using the p-type and we were jumping into the, you know, deeper into the header, we were taking a cache miss, and it actually hurt us in this case, and it was like, hmm, that sucks. Um, but then including the rest of that part of the header, uh, we can see that we actually basically doubled performance between no hints at all and using the hints to go ahead and identify this uh, and then decide what to do in terms of the load balancing action. Um, two things to mention here. One, the hardware that this was done on, um, we were able to generate the packet type from the hardware, right? That it can parse that already. The RSS hash is also generated by the hardware, but the rest of this we kind of faked, right? Our hardware didn't have the capability to pull that out into some kind of hardware structure like a descriptor. So we actually had the driver parse this out of the packet header. Everything's already cache hot, but we mimicked it as far as the XTP program was concerned that metadata was generated by the hardware. So that's point number one. So there's extra cycles going on. Um, point number 1.1 1 .1, um, is because the way that we pass the metadata across, we pass it as part of the XDP buff, right? So we, we put it in front of the, the packet payload and we don't have the ability to DMA that directly in front of the packet payload yet. So we have the overhead of a mem copy or a few mem copies in this case. So that's data point number two. And the third one is that title at the top was the load balancer with no state tracking. Uh, and that's very important. Uh, and this is where I said we had some interesting data that was good and not so great. So looking at this with state tracking, um, yes. Correct, these are TX actions, yes. That's a good point. You're gonna yeah, talk the, to the box next time. Yeah, the, 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 the question was these are straight TX actions, not redirects, and that is correct, they are TX. Um, so in this case, uh, this is the same exact setup. Now, granted, we boiled it down to using um, four cues, again, on these last three. Um, and the no hints, which is the big red one, 
and the hints type 2, which is everything, have the same exact performance. Um, and we were like, well, crap. That's not ex exactly what we expected. Um, so there was a lot of head scratching. And uh, we did find that the extra overhead of the map uh, lookups and updates and everything to maintain the state uh, was actually eating into the performance that we were gaining by having this metadata uh, being uh, passed along. The CPU usage was different, which was kind of promising. So we're, we're, you know, we had some headroom, but we had to figure out where it was getting stuck in. Have any idea the order of magnitude of CPU usage decreasing? Uh, that's the next slide. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, but but this, one, this one was kind of baffling, right? That, that we, we stared at this for a while and actually got pretty discouraged. Um, however, the next slide will show that it's not as bad as we thought. Um, this link at the bottom uh, is also referenced in the paper for this. This is where we actually have our driver patches um, showing how we mimic um, the, the hints. Uh, this is on the i40e driver, by the way. So we started digging into some perf stats, uh, trying to figure out where cycle counts are and what's going on. Um, and so on the right side, um, basically what we saw and why I mentioned the mem copies and the um, other parsing that was happening, we were seeing that there was some cycle count. Um, basically, the CPU was stalled while we were waiting for some uh, uh, cache hit, uh, cache miss um, resolutions, and then also the mem copies and the parsing itself were causing a lot of cache thrash. Um, so we believe that uh, based, and this is all paper math, we didn't actually verify this with hardware because we don't have hardware that does this yet, um, that we, we we're pretty confident that we can get at least a 7% gain um, in the stateful load balancing. So it's not earth shattering but it is something that is worth pursuing, right? It, that, that's 7% 7 7 CPU cycles on a host that you can put to better use on your, uh, on your Xeon hosts. Um, so this, this data is as much as we could get for the conference here. We do have next steps that we want to go ahead, um, use some of our newer hardware that is able to go ahead and do some of this stuff um, in silicon uh, to verify this. We have some other POCs in flight um, that can really hone in on this even more. Uh, we just couldn't get it uh, by the time for the conference due, due to time. Um, I think you're just seeing the confluence of the fact that you have this software simulator of your hints in combination with all the memory traffic added by the state tracking stuff, and then you, you go over the cliff. Yeah, it was pretty, pretty uh, eye-opening that we, we just kind of hit this barrier, and then it was just like everything just stopped at a certain point. Um, so some of the next steps and, and the uh, previous talk was very interesting on the stateless nature. nature. Um, we do believe that some of the applications here, maybe stateful connections or stateful based uh, XDP programs aren't the right way to attack with these types of techniques. But stateless ones, obviously, if we you know, just go back to this, you know, we're seeing double the performance in stateless um, approaches. So that's the next step. We want to go after some more stateless uh, based XDP programs to see where we can really uh, have some value at here. Um, but Saeed, you want to come up? Uh, and he's going to go ahead and uh, continue on uh, some other data that he's been able to gather. OK, so thanks, PJ, for. Uh a nice Intel back background for my uh, Milan slides. Oh, this is the first. Um, so I'm going to discuss now um, our experiments with the, uh, our own patches for the hardware hands and the challenges for the API we, uh, we've been working on to, to, uh, to make this generic for every uh, vendor. So before we go into the uh, details for the API, I'm going to show some uh, performance uh, numbers that we, we saw with the XDP TX IP tunnel uh, kernel sample, which, um, which also kind of doing what uh, any um, load balancer running in production today without the load balancing, right? So it's, uh, it's trying to receive packets, classify the, those packets, find the, the uh, destination IP, and the destination TCP or UDP port. And according to that, 
look up into a PPF table or PPF map and find the uh, IP tunnel corresponding to the uh, IP and IP tunnel corresponding to that packet and send it back to wire. So what we uh, try to do there is um, to save some CPU by uh, avoiding the lookup and the parsing of the packet using some kind of uh, uh, TC rule to mark to mark these packets with a, a hardware, what we call a flow mark in the hardware. And uh, by, by saving CPU with, uh, with just looking up the, this flow mark, this unique flow mark, which is we have a unique flow mark per um, source, uh, per, per this three top, tuple that we have, the TCP, the, the TCP port and the uh, destination IP. And we, we, we see uh, 50, almost 50 to 70 percent for some cases uh, performance improvement. And then we hit the uh, PCI bottleneck that Jasper was talking about at uh, almost 50, 55 uh, million packets per second. So we expect more. Uh, we have patches to overcome this uh, PCI bottleneck. And we expect uh, even the, 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 the program without the hint would, would hit the uh, 100 uh, CPU mo uh, mark much, much before uh, the, the version with the hardware hints, and we, we, we expect much more performance improvements. Um, so regarding the API, we would like to have a generic API which would provide um, a nice way to enable uh, the whole thing, the, 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 the XDP, uh, the, the driver hints for XDP program for legacy NX like the IXGPE, I4PE, and the Monix devices, they currently they, they fit in the middle between legacy and programmable NX. So programmable NX will provide a more flexible way to, 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 to ask for specific hardware hints and not everything. So today, Legacy Nix, Nix provide everything in the descriptor, and we would like also to have uh, future Nix to provide specific hardware hints for specific programs or specific use cases. Also, we would like to have an association for Rx metadata. So for a simple use case, they have to provide uh, all, all the hardware hints that are available in the specific hardware or a subset of them for all Rx queues. And uh, we would like also legacy program to run without uh, requiring metadata at all. And uh, we would like also um, to have per RxQ metadata. This is useful for AFXDP use cases, which, which, we, which we will have a specific socket running on a specific rank, on a specific set of uh, workload, and it would like to see a specific set of metadata. Uh, so we'd like to, to have the same uh, programming, programming mo module that we already have today with a specific, with a, with a small change that you would ask the driver to provide you hints for, for the program you're, you're attaching. And with the API that I'm going to discuss in the next, next slide, um, you would get the hints that you requested in a generic way which would work uh, in the same programming module for each and every uh, NIC provider. And um, we would like also to support XDP, XDP metadata configuration at, lo at load time or compile time by uh, having a dynamic way and, or API to, to ask for the metadata that you're requiring for your specific XDP program and use case. Um, so one approach is op uh, the first option that I have implemented. Uh, in this, I think last summer. Um, so what I did is, uh, is a simple solution where you have a, a, a pre-known or pre well-defined metadata that are already um, known by the kernel and already used even by SKBs today. You have SKB field, fields that are populated with these metadata. And these fields are stored in a, a nice uh, fields offset array. Um, each, each, um, each element in the array defines where this metadata is stored in the XDP buffer metadata pointer. If it's there, it's gonna give you the offset. If it's not there, it's gonna say minus one, for example. And I'm not going to do, go into details, but the way to, to, to for example, to see uh, in, the, in the last line, the option number one, 
can see how we access the, the flow mark just by having a difference to the offset array for the well-known XDP meta flow mark. And uh, when it's well-known, it, you have the offset and you know the size and the, 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 the format of that flow mark, so you just typecast it and um, you will have it, right? So the problem is with, the, with this approach, it's, uh, it's a fixed ap approach for, for a well-known uh, metadata, but if, if, you, if you want to introduce a new one, you will have to introduce it to the driver, kernel, and user space program. So it's really not scalable, and it's really not fix, uh, flexible, uh, but it's a really nice, easy way to access and uh, know the format of uh, the metadata. And here come option number two, where we uh, would uh, use the BTF uh, approach, which is a PPF type format, was introduced by Facebook at uh, kernel 4.15. And the idea there, is, I think it's simple, because uh, BTF is just a, a nice way to describe uh, C-like structures, and you can, uh, Describe it in a specific uh, description, translate it to, into C language or C header files, and just compile with it. So it's going to describe the metadata is coming in from the hardware in a nice uh, header file. So the idea is that you, before, drive, before loading the XDP program or even before compiling it, you would query the driver, the hardware, or the NIC. It's going to give you back the BTF format. You're going to uh, translate it into uh, C header file, and um, then just compile your program and uh, just uh, hit like uh, just in your uh, XDP code, just uh, do XDP you know, metadata and uh, access the hash or checksum or uh, whatever offload or metadata you're looking for if it's provided by the hardware, of course. And um, we would like optionally to have it per driver, firmware version, and even specific configuration in your um, NIC. Uh, and we would like also to verify it at the driver, uh, uh, on the PPF load of the XDP program, so you would, we would know that you're using the right BTF uh, version and not using an old one or a different hardware. So we'd fail that if you're using a BTF program, which uh, XDP program which was compiled with a, with outdated BTF uh, format. Um, this will enable us to have a s different uh, offloads or uh, metadata formats for uh, different NICs, and uh, this will uh, allow flexibility and scalability without every time the need to change the kernel in order to introduce new types and have new types for metadata and uh, hardware hints for newer versions of hardware, firmware, or even uh, proprietary uh, hardware hands. So I'm going to discuss some um, some pros and cons for, between the two approaches. And I feel that we all agree, and what we had in the discussion in the mailing list, that we all agree to, to go into the BTF approach. But I would like to uh, emphasize some um, pros and cons between uh, the two approaches. So using the BTF is good for allowing, as I said, allowing vendor-specific or defined uh, hints uh, very easily without the need to change the kernel. Just uh, install the new firmware, query the, the driver, and it will give you the new format and the new, uh, and the new offload you're looking for. Um, metadata access of the XDP program is, is, is figured out at compile time. You don't have to use offset array to calculate the uh, offset of the um, um, metadata that you're looking for, just you compile the driver with a BTF uh, descriptor and you have a direct access to your uh, hardware hand. Uh, what is really bothering me and, uh, is that with, with the BTF approach is that you will have to recompile your, your XDP program with every uh, version of, uh, with every NIC that you're using. So, uh, and even if you upgrade the firmware, you will get a new uh, BTF um, version, you'll have to recompile the, the XDP program. I think this is really bad for production, but it's really flexible, so it's uh, I, I wonder if we can get to the point where 
if the standardized fields sit in some common structure. So yeah, this is exactly my next point. Okay, so, never mind. I'm not going to steal your thunder. Yeah. So we also need to figure out how do we standardize some fields like hash, checksum. They are all the same. They are the same for all hardware next. So it's really up to naming convention, right? So if you uh, would like to see only the hash, so it would act to request from the driver. I would like uh, your BTF descriptor with only the hash. You m mask everything, mark them as reserved, and just compile your, your, uh, your program with pointing to the hash that you got with the BTF descriptor of that uh, uh, specific NIC. And if you recompile the same program with different NICs, you will, you will, uh, you will get the same behavior. You, you will get the hash um, field. Um, but it's really up to the uh, uh, NIC vendors to decide or define what are the <coughs> standardized fields and how they look like. The problem is with the offset, it's going to be a different offset for every uh, NIC. And also sometimes it's up to um, the NDNS. Of the, it's it's, it's, it's going to be a big Indian for all vendors, so you're going to have to um, to translate it to uh, little Indian whatever in the XDP program, which is also kind of sucks. Um, here are links to um, the, the work in progress for Intel and uh, for Mellanox as well. And please feel free to uh, review it and uh, um, look at it. Um, I think we, um, your patches have the BTF in them? No. No, not yet. Did you, did you they, we haven't released those yet. So yeah, we, we still also, we're still considering the BTF approach and we really need an agreement uh, um, for this. For, um, so yeah, next steps is to get an agreement whether we are going to the BTF approach or not. So we start because it's a lot of programming. Um, so yeah, we need to get that out of the way. Uh, next thing. Chaining, I think, is a very simple approach uh, to achieve uh, because chaining, to, p to pass the, the metadata from XDP program to the next one, you just populate the metadata with, what, with, whatever, with, with whatever metadata you want because it's an XDP program specific thing. Now, uh, there's a pro problem with the placement of the XDP metadata. Today, it sits before the XDP, before the XDP uh, packet and it's um, it's it's okay if you're not going to do uh, XDP adjust head if you're not going to use the head room at all but if you are for example the encapsulating or uh, changing the headers or uh, in, um, increasing the packet size whatever you're doing adding a VLAN header uh, you would hit a problem you would hit a problem with the uh, overriding the, the XDP uh, metadata and you will have to main copy all, all, every time you're going to do adjust hit. And you would lose any performance hit you, we, 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 you got from the hardware hint. So, so, there are some kind, so there are some solution for this. In my patches I did invalidate the metadata once I read them. So once I got the metadata in the XDP program, I just invalidated the metadata. I just said oh, there are no more metadata anymore in there. So once I called adjust hit, there was no metadata to move around. So this fixed the issue uh, locally for me. Uh, one way to do it, we, we thought about placing the metadata hard, to, the metadata into the hard start, the start of the page, that also would help. And I just uh, discussed it with uh, Jesper, we have a, I got a, a nice idea. If it's possible, I think uh, Jesper said it, it, it is, to just expose the, uh, hardware descriptor into the XDP program as a read-only pointer. That would help a lot with the BTF. If we can describe the metadata, or the, the hardware descriptor with a BTF prog uh, uh, format and give it to the XDP program. Four minutes. Yeah, um, I think we're going to on this issue. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so looking beyond this, right, so we, in this morning's uh, first talk, we also looked at how can some of this uh, hardware Acceleration maybe you apply to things like um, helping the TX checksum offload on either XDBTX or redirect, right? Can we place some metadata to help on the way back out of the NIC 
um, for NCAP, DCAP, QoS, if we're doing traffic shaping in any way, um, what can we do with this framework to help expand that? So these are things that we're going to look at next um, once we get past the BTF uh, formatting and how we, how we handle that. Um, and then the, 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 the big one, I think, that we're going to get some really big bang for our buck on some of the new NICs um, coming out in the next few years, or some of them that are existing today as well, is how do we go with these uh, flow lookup, lookups and actions? How do we utilize uh, some of this advanced internal uh, infrastructure in the NICs that can either um, do like internal switching, you know, through uh, based on an action in a TCAM? Um, can we really push some of that down so that we still have the XTP program core running in the kernel, that we have introspection into the actual application running, but then get the benefit of hardware offload um, transparently to the program. And that's, that's really something I think is going to be pretty powerful, but there's a lot of work to do here. XTP is a slow path for the hardware. Yeah, XTP is the slow path for the hardware, exactly. And um, yeah, and now we have a couple minutes for questions. We have for time questions. for a quick question or two. If we manage to standardize not only the naming convention in the BTF, but also the offsets, would we still need to recompile no, XTP? No, no, no. So the whole idea... <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't Please talk speak to into the, the box. I didn't talk to the box. I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, so the, so the, the, the thing that maybe isn't sinking in is that the whole idea is that LLVM will support symbolic loads of offsets into structures. So it, you'll get a load to like task PID for a trace point, right? And then the verifier will translate that using BTF into the actual hexadecimal load and rewrite the load instruction for you. So this will all be transparent. So, so our, our original proposal last year was to standardize the format so that it was rigid. And like Saeed said, that's just not scalable. You have some new offload come, you have some new capability. Now you have to change the kernel, right? And we want to avoid that at all costs. Oh, John's got it up. I, it's an easy one, I think. Um, this always comes up that we want a pointer to the descriptor, and then we want to figure out how to map it. Have, have you ever just considered having like a JIT for the driver on the back end that translates the, the lookup into a descriptor? Because but you're behind the verifier after the JIT, you could have like a I40E JIT that maps the hash into the descriptor read, and then you wouldn't you wouldn't have this question come up all the time about how do we optimize for my descriptor? Or like a BT a BPF template. Something like that. So mm -hmm. then th that gets jitted uh, beforehand. I think that sounds like a cool idea. That's a yeah. really good yeah. idea. Yeah. All right, last question. John went easy on us. Yeah, so the, the, we had that idea of doing the rewrite. The, the problem becomes like you actually have to generate the code when you want to do the rewrite because the fields in the descriptors are usually masked. Like whether the field is present or not is dependent on something else. Well, since the verifier has access to the actual full BPF program, it can emit masking and using a temp register and stuff like that. But yes, that is a good point. The fields aren't homogenous 32-bit values. Okay. Thank you right. very, Thanks, very much. Thanks.